this afternoon we are having a discussion what we now call the webinar on certain aspects of the new education policy initially we had requested dr kasturi rangan my old colleague and friend who chaired the drafting committee of the new policy uh, to join us and to be the lead speaker in this discussion he had very graciously agreed and we had fixed today's date in consultation with the other speakers but as it happened quite unforeseen uh, he came up with certain commitments uh, this afternoon uh, to which he could not have said no because of the very nature of those commitments so i am here really as a substitute and you will have to suffer me for the next hour or so uh, i will not speak very much about the the policy because we have invited uh, specialist experts who have spent long years in their lives in this arena i will speak very briefly but i before i do that let me again very briefly introduce the distinguished panelists of this afternoon our first speaker is professor anurag bahar am i right professor bahar we call it bahar or we call it what am i pronouncing yes. it correctly we call it bihar bihar sorry my apologies professor anurag bihar he has been wearing many hats in the past years in the corporate sector and uh, medical systems healthcare ecology environment big business and management of educational institutions but most of all today he is with us essentially in the capacity as vice chancellor of the azam premji university and uh, perhaps even more important he was uh, one of the distinguished persons responsible for drafting the new education policy he shall be speaking to us on the broad rationale of the policy and speak to us for 15 minutes our second speaker is a old veteran professor krishna kumar from the old delhi delhi university department of education and then long years in the cert i would consider him a great specialist in the area of school education curricular reform various issues which go along with school education he has done a great deal in terms of textbook reform and uh, been a member of many if not most of the national level committees dealing with education issues of education written many books and he shall be speaking to us this afternoon particular focus on the school education perspective in the new education policy our next speaker is professor sham menon as one of our members we have close interaction with him as it happens after the onset of covid there's been disruption we had planned a series of discussions on the new education policy as early as january this year when we met uh, we had one or two discussion then there was a gap and i'm glad we are meeting here again today he's again uh, well known in the field of education um educated in kerala then he baroda university he taught in baroda university he taught in delhi university the education arena teaching of teachers and so on then he spent years in the cert he had also been on various boards and committees at the national level dealing with various aspects of uh, education um in the term century he spent a considerable amount of time in um, a theoretical a conceptual work on the new public university if i may use the word 
and the, the, the net outcome was the concept of the Ambedkar Universities. And he was the first Vice Chancellor, founder Vice Chancellor of the Ambedkar University in Delhi, where he spent no less than 10 years. He shall be speaking to us on the higher education perspectives in the new education policy which we are discussing today. And next uh, to, to, to Professor Shah Menon, we have an IS officer, retired IS officer Amitabh Bhattacharya. He has spent some years in the UNDP. He's also worked in the private sector. He's an engineering background, project planning, execution, infrastructure development. He's also been on the faculty of the Lal Bhadar Shastri National Academy of Administration in Missouri and dealt with education in a different manner. We invited him because of his quite different uh, experience outside the professional education arena to be a discussant and he will make his observation for 10 minutes. Now before I invite uh, Professor Behar to, to, to speak to us, I just thought I'd make one or two very, very broad points. As some of you may perhaps know, I was in uh, Jammu and Kashmir for a considerable period. And uh, in my capacity as governor of the state, uh, according to the laws of the state, I was the chancellor of four state universities, chancellor of one shrine board, Mata Vaishnudev University, and the president of India had appointed me as chancellor of the founder chancellor of the Central University of Jammu when it was founded. My own experience and observations, very, very rough and very quick, is that education is in the concurrent arena, in the concurrent list of our constitution. And since we are a large country, large student population, large basic population, large issues of coordination arise. And uh, my experience has been that they remain unattended, unsettled, and education suffers. The second observation I have to make is that in the states, the level and the quality of attention devoted to educational matters, to the management of education, if I may use the word, both education, uh, both at the school level and at the college level and at the professional level, is in inadequate to use a very moderate term. A, there is no political will, there is no interest. B, there is also lack of capacity, capability, capacity to, to how to manage an educational institution. We are not invariably successful in managing even schools for the simple reason that we, we are not very clear on what exactly requires to be done. So I'm raising this issue because in the context of the new education policy, very large implementational issues will arise. The questions of accreditation, when you defiliate the host of institutions presently in existence, you create a competition, hopefully. And hopefully, again, I, 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 I would expect that we create an environment which, which is a merit-oriented environment where institutions which are truly meritorious and competent, they, they get higher ratings, they emerge as the best institutions to go to. Another, another uh, problem which is bound to rise straight away, irrespective of the level of interest in the states, is question of resources. How are we going to deal with that? And third, again, is a messy issue. This is a question of vested interests. In the states where which, which have witnessed a reasonable or a good deal of growth of the private sector in education, all manner of institutions have developed. And uh, there is no uniformity of standards. There is a large problem in regard to the manner in which education is imparted, how degrees are imparted, how PhDs are awarded, and so on. So we shall have to 
battle with all these problems. Now, I'd given myself 10 minutes. I don't want to go on and on. But one last point is the, in my perception, when I was a student some 75 years ago, I would say that the role of the teacher, the role, the responsibility, the dignity that you attach to a primary school teacher, um, middle school teacher, a high school teacher, to a college lecturer, to a professor in a university, to the vice chancellor of university. Where do we place him in society? In my time, the teacher was poorly paid, as most others were in the professional areas in the British times, but uh, held in high regard, high esteem, high respect. I remember that my all my elders in the family, my father, my elder brothers, when, when they had to meet my teacher, for instance, the person who was teaching me or the, who was the school teacher, then uh, it was not just an offhand matter. Somebody could just go and meet him like that. There was some procedure, there was some process, there was some dignity about the whole, whole, whole exchange. Today, I unfortunately, while the salaries in the, the uh, formal sector are uh, fairly good, if I may say so, as compared to the time I was lecturer in the Punjab University, less than 200 rupees a month, I, I dare say that our teachers are well paid, well treated today, well regarded also. But as it happens, uh, a teacher's position is, is uh, not what it, I feel it should be. And most of all, to put it uh, very briefly, if you made a vice chancellor responsible for, for the uh, for the intellectual growth and development of 20,000, 30,000, 40,000 children, whether constituent or affiliated and much larger number, what authority have you given him? Do you interfere in his work? The question, uh, issues which relate to autonomy versus uh, uh, some kind of management of control, control systems, autonomy versus control, and um, least of all, which I hope that we are able to turn the leaf, is the enormous amount of political interference in the initial selection of teachers, school teachers by the thousand, by the lakh, and by if I may say so, then their appointments, then their transfers. Essential interest in education in the states is raised to selections, appointments, and transfers. Not to where the teacher teaches, what is the quality of teaching, what is available in the school or the college or the university, that seems to be nobody's business. So I will stop here. These are many questions. And I will now, it is uh, 13 minutes past four. I've crossed my limit by three minutes. I will uh, now ask Professor Anurag Baer to please speak to us. Professor Baer. Thank you, Mr. Mora. Thank you so much. Good evening. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Pleasure to be talking about uh, the National Education Policy 2020. Uh, I had the privilege of being a part of the drafting committee, uh, which was the Dr. Kathirangan committee. So much of what I share with you today is on the basis of that experience. And in the way that I have seen that the draft policy, which itself was uh, 484 pages, has uh, in a sense, been summarized into the 66-page policy, which has been approved by the union cabinet. Now, what I will do is I'll, my remarks will be in three parts. The first part is a bit of a story. It's a story that brings to life some matters of the policy. The second part, is about the choices, the choices on the basis of which the policy has been made or the choices that the policy has made. And we all know policies are about choices. And therefore, this is perhaps the most important of all things to consider when we think of the fundamentals. Third, I'll share a, a few brief remarks about uh, the implementation 
uh, its possible challenges, much of it is well known. So let me start with the brief story that I was talking about. I'm speaking to you from Bhopal today. Day before yesterday, I was in a place which is between the two towns of Sagar and Rehli, somewhere in central Madhya Pradesh. It was the afternoon. It was a small village off the highway. I had gone there because there's a government primary school teacher who goes every day to the village in these days when the schools are not open. And what he's done is that he's mobilized four volunteers in the village. His school where he serves has about 40 students, grade one to five. He arranges those 40 odd students in four different places. One is in the village temple. The other is on one, op one courtyard, which has a sort of a shade and two other places. And with the help of those four volunteers who are basically, you know, class 10 and class 12 girls, he's been teaching those kids. The day that I went there, it was raining. It's unusual for that part of Madhya Pradesh to be raining so heavily as it was, but he was there nevertheless. It is quite remarkable. And his, and his essential explanation was, well, you know, how can I let this happen? The pandemic has stopped schools for such a long time. What will happen to my kids? Now, this man, once he finished that, he was talking with me. And I was surprised, but it's not as though I've been su not surprised before. Similarly, he said, Sab, jo hai, the new national education policy is very good. I said, Achha. I asked him, why? Why are you saying that the national education policy is good? And he had absolute specifics. So let me point out the three specifics that he said. One, he said, sir, Mary to umar ho gai. to retire hone wala hon. I'm near retirement. But this policy, what it does is that it equates the service conditions and the compensation, the scales of the primary school teacher to that of the secondary and the higher secondary school teacher. It's, it is, it's saying, well, the role of a primary school teacher is as challenging, as complex as important that as a, of a higher secondary or a secondary school teacher. So why should they be paid any less? And it's that service condition issue which forces teachers like me, I'm paraphrasing him, to look for, in quotes, promotion. And the primary system keeps losing good teachers. So this policy is remarkable that it's equating and giving equal importance to these two teachers categories, which it must be. Second, he said, This is well known to all of us. The BH system is dysfunctional, it's corrupt, and the policy is taking it head on. That's what he was saying. And third, he says, look, the policy says something very simple and basic, which is that how can we expect our teachers to have perhaps the kind of position that Mr. Vora was talking about, if we are not willing to give them the very basics of life, if where they are working, they don't have a toilet, if the textbooks that they are supposed to be working with, they arrive six months out of the session starts. So the policy commits to making sure that the basic conditions for the teacher are fulfilled and met. And so he said, this policy is remarkable. I came back came back actually to Sagar, which is uh, the closest town, which is where I'm stay staying. And I was reflecting about it. And I must say that while this is the first instance of such a conversation that I've had with school teachers after the policy was approved by the un union cabinet, I've had similar conversations many a times after the draft national education policy was set out for public comment. Now, I'm going to move on to the second part of my remarks. The reason 
the reason he is able to say all this the reason he feels all this is because of the choices the policy is based on the choices that the policy has made so the second part of what i'm sharing is about the choices and when once we talk about choices we have to remember that the choices that were made other choices could have been made also the choices are not made in vacuum they are of course made in the context of the history of our education system but even more so they are made in the context of the current social political environment okay so these choices that have been made the choices that have been made are absolutely related to the current environment and they could have therefore been something else altogether so what are these choices that i am talking about which i am giving so much importance to right i must mention that i think these are the good and the right choices i'll can't take all of them but i'll take a few and what i'll do is when i talk about a choice i will actually illustrate it with some concrete example from within the policy let's take the first one given where we stand today not today or the past 10 15 20 years the policy could have made a choice of a very instrumental narrow view of education that the only purpose of education is to create people for employment or develop people for employment or employability it has not done that it has taken a much broader view of what education is which is the view we have taken from 1966 but it has endorsed that view of education as a fundamental process for social human development as a fundamental democratic process and that makes all the difference subsequently to the policy now when i say that that that's the choice it has made where does one see it actually as i said you know uh, where does it really take shape in the policy of course it's reaffirmed in the statements about the purpose of education but even more than that as you will go through the policy you'll see that it commits explicitly not once but in all relevant places to the kind of values and dispositions the kind of values and dispositions education should develop and those values and dispositions the capacities that it extols scientific temper critical thinking these are these are the kind of things that would not have been there had it taken a very narrow instrumental view of education we would have just talked about skilling and developing people for the job market the second place where it uh, very strongly very explicitly expresses this choice is this strong commitment to liberal education very strong commitment to liberal education and uh, it is much talked about in the media and the strong commitment to liberal education is not only at the level of undergraduate education but the notion of how grades 9 10 11 12 12 are to be restructured is also based on the essence of liberal education third and this is to my mind very important the choice the choice of these broader purposes of education vis-a-vis -vis the narrow purposes of education it reflects in the emphasis the policy gives on the importance of cultural consonance within the system what is it saying essentially it's essentially saying that if that is the purpose of education if that's what we want if we want our children to develop the capacity to think for themselves <clears throat> it's not just in the classroom that this happens is the culture of the institution the school the college the education system we know that impacts it and therefore it it tries to sew together a fine tapestry of a culture which will support this kind of education i'll give you a few specifics mr vora was actually referring to something there which is it explicitly commits very strongly autonomy of institutions autonomy of schools and autonomy autonomy of higher education institutions it commits to a structure which is board governed which is much like what we have in the iims
and it commits therefore through that structure to eliminate perhaps at a later date but reduce certainly any kind of external interference it empowers the teacher and the institutions it actually changes the regulatory environment and all that why because unless you have cultural consonance with those purposes of education it's very unlikely those wonderful statements that we make are actually ever going to become real so choosing not instrumental but choosing the broader aims of education is a central theme a central principle of this policy second again given the times we live in given what we have seen over the past 10 15 20 years it could have taken a very technocratic view of education very very technocratic view of education it does not it explicitly and its and its detail recognizes is informed by that education is a social human endeavor you cannot have a technocratic lens is management important for sure is technology important for sure but that's just additions the base is on the base of a social human endeavor now as i mentioned let me take a few examples where do you see this you see this in the policy across i'll give you a few instances the centrality of the teacher it gives teacher in some senses central place and uh, it's not merely a matter of compensation it's so many other things it's about the stuff that i the teacher in that village in sagar talked about or near sagar talked about it's about basic respect it's about empowering them at a date to actually develop their curriculum so the centrality of the teacher is one thing where you can see this emphasis on education being a social human endeavor and not something technocratic second i'm using an illustration there are many such things second it doesn't fall prey to the simplistic notions of accountability that have corroded education system after education system it doesn't say that look let's let's look at the scores of the students and on that basis decide whether a teacher is good or not let's not shut down or invest into schools on the basis of just bare results of stu students we're familiar that that kind of simplistic simplistic accountability systems have corroded education system after education system corroded institution after institution right and it takes this nuanced view of what education is and therefore doesn't fall into the trap of such sim simplistic accountability systems third third it's quite clear that the policy recognizes that equity leads quality quality does not lead equity and that's again arising from this commitment of what its understanding of education is where do you see this where do you see this in the policy that equity leads quality i'll give you a range of instances it's dramatic it's if there is a centerpiece commitment in the policy the centerpiece commitment in the policy is to early childhood education and the centerpiece commitment is about equity because the truth of the situation today is that is the privileged who go to early childhood institutions and those who cannot do not have the benefit of that care that education so its centerpiece commitment is a big push on equity second and I'll, i'll i'll take an instance which is uh, at the other extreme why does it envision the national research foundation it envisions the Res national research foundation to foster catalyze a culture of research in the country not focused on our premier institutions it's focused on the state universities the colleges that's what it's focused on and that to my mind is a is an aspect of equity which we don't necessarily look at i'll take a third instance and this is a very interesting instance of detail it explicitly mentions 
that the teacher pupil ratio in schools that serve disadvantaged students can actually be much better you may have a 30s to 1 teacher student ratio in schools that serve relatively well off students but students that come from disadvantaged families per they need a lot more attention and therefore we should consider a much better teacher pupil ratio right lastly on the matter of choices and i'll keep this very brief it has made the choice the policy has made the choice to confront some of the most contentious contentious so the most problematic some of the most entrenched and some of the most difficult issues head on it's confronting those issues head on it could have made the choice to leave them on the side skirt away i'll take a few instances first it makes an explicit confession an explicit acknowledgement that we are facing a crisis in our early school years that of learning of language of of arithmetic of mathematics and therefore it talks about a range of measures to address this rapidly over the next 5 years confronting that issue stating it so explicitly is i think what is really critical the choice could have been to underplay it the choice could have been to at least, uh, even not even acknowledge it and this full frontal acceptance is to my mind a very important choice that's been made second and again i'll go back to the teacher nia sagar it confronts the issue head on that our bet system our teacher education system leave aside a few good institutions a few maybe a few hundred good institutions but otherwise is dysfunctional it needs to be rebuilt and it's not just the institutional structure it's our imagination of what teacher education is and as we are familiar their vested interests galore what it means is that we have to shut down hundreds of bet colleges perhaps or ndlet colleges let's take another one where it confronts directly regulatory ineffectiveness we have a regulatory environment a regulatory set of institutions a structure which is neither been able to stop commercialization and trivialization of education it's not done that on the other hand it's not in any way set any kind of standards i mean our our our, our high education system is bearing the brunt of that kind of a regulatory institution structure and culture school education too and it confronts that directly right. so with that which is the choices that are made which form the fundamentals of this policy and that could have been very different about what is the purpose of education how that informs the policy about a technocratic versus a social human endeavor view of education and about confronting head on some of the most difficult issues this is what forms the basis of the policy i'll just briefly allude to the implementation aspect and then i'll hand it back we all know that the devil is in the detail and the devil is not really in the detail of the policy the devil is really in the detail of the implementation we all know that policies have been made policies have come and gone and it's the implementation that makes it happen i would think it's too early to comment on the implementation we can have just some very brief very very brief perhaps comments one that the policy has explicitly committed and it's a reaffirmation of an old commitment of investing 6% of gdp into, into public education and we have to see whether the trend line over the next 2 3 years really tracks to that increase and that really is in some senses the litmus test this year we know what we are facing it's an it's an unprecedented time so i won't pay too much attention to this year but 
over the next two to three years, we have to watch, observe, how does public expenditure track? Does it go step by step by step? In the draft national education policy, we had recommended take 10 years to do it. Let's see how it goes. So I think to my mind, that's really, I mean, you could look at all kinds of indicators, but perhaps that's one of the most important indicators. Second, there are many things about the implementation of this policy that do not require money or do not require significant financial outlay. And I think a big test of the implementation is whether they are being done quickly, both at the government of India and of course the states. The legisl legislative action that been, can be taken. There is, as I mentioned, be it colleges and other kind of institutions that are really not colleges or education institutions, but just shops, they can be shut. That doesn't require money or then perhaps legal fees. And uh, the restructuring of the government structures, particularly in school education, that uh, the, the policy mentions, that can be taken. That does not require financial outlay. Right? So that's something else that we can look at. Third and last, and I think this to my mind is even more important than the money, even more important than the legis legislative action, is at the level of the detail of the implementation of where people are required. What kind of people are we choosing? And I'm not talking about when the Higher Education Commission of India comes into being, on the National Research Foundation comes into being. You know, those institutions are so much in the spotlight that an effort will be made to get very good people there. That's not, that's not where the crunch is. The crunch is really, what kind of people are we choosing to be heading colleges and universities in the states, in the small towns? That, to my mind, is going to be the crucial test in the early years of implementation. We don't know. Implementation, as Mr. Vora mentioned, has been the bane of all policies. We'll see over the next couple of years. All I can say is that given the choices that the policy has made, and given the choices the policy has made in the social political environment that we live in, I think it's worth giving it every shot. It's worth giving all our support, all our might to make it happen. And we are quibbling about details. Those details can be battled out actually out there in the field when we are implementing it. Let me end by saying that in 2015, when this policy making was initiated, flagged off, if in 2015 somebody had told me or somebody had shown me this policy, I would have welcomed it with 100 cheers. Now that it's 2020, and now we have this policy, I would actually welcome it with 1,000 cheers. Because in my mind, it's absolutely important to look at the fundamental choices that have been made. Thank you. With that, it's back over to you. Anurag Bahar. Uh, I would now call upon uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. Is he here? Yes. <laughs> so, he would be speaking uh, to us on perspectives of school education. Thank you, uh, Mr. Bora and Mr. Srivastava, uh, fellow panelists, uh, friends. It gives me great pleasure to join this discussion on the new uh, national policy of education. No policy document is uh, easy to read, um, and this one is no different. Uh, one looks for its vision, one looks for the assumptions on which it is based. One also looks at the information it uses and the information it um, ignores. And more than anything else, uh, one tries to find which systemic experience uh, does it privilege and which experience it decides to ignore. 
that's also uh, where many choices are made in all policy documents. If we look back over the last more than a hundred years of attempts to create a policy for as diverse a country as ours, with uh, a very complex society and uh, numerous forms of inequalities, modern education has certainly faced an enormous challenge in our country, and surely this is the right moment in the middle of a pandemic for us to worry about our children as um, a new policy attempts to guide their future. When I look back over the last three decades, uh, a little more than that, since the promulgation of the last national policy of 1986, I find the most uh, path-breaking event uh, to be the promulgation of the Right to Education Act by the Indian Parliament. This act came in as an enabling law permitting the amendment to the constitution which was made earlier, which would allow every child in India, no matter what his or her background, to have the advantage of eight continuous years of free and compulsory education. In many ways, this was a momentous law to be passed by the Indian Parliament. And in fact, it was the first parliamentary um, law in the field of school education. It took nearly a century to come to this point. Therefore, for our nation, it was a major moment. For us who work in the field of education, it was also a great moment to witness a document which finally created a credible and firm foundation for a school system in India. It defined a school system with the help of stringent norms that it laid down. It defined the school system in terms of the kinds of purposes which elementary education must serve. And it also created a sense of a parameter beyond which the system will not be allowed to deviate, so to say. In many ways, it was a path-breaking document, therefore. It posed an end, so to say, to volunteerism, to the discourse of non-formal education, which the 1986 policy had, in fact, under those circumstances, permitted uh, to become part of uh, the system. The RTE law ultimately promised to India a system where all aspects from teacher to curriculum to infrastructure and uh, conditions in which children are taught, all these aspects will become justiciable. The fact that uh, the RTE law made um, a clear-cut outline of what is it that constitutes the right of children from 6 to 14 years of age to education. The fact that it delineated the parameters of a system so clearly uh, was indeed a heartening moment for uh, lakhs of people like me uh, who work in this sector. The late Professor Tapas Mazumdar had provided an initial estimate of the financial support that the translation of the right to education into a social reality will require. It was a considerable budget that Professor Majumdar presented and justified. And it was going to be a part of the implementation process in which both the center and the states would have a clearly 
indicated share as far as financial responsibilities were concerned. Now, merely a decade has passed since the social history of RTE actually started to unfold. And this decade has not been a particularly easy decade because the RTE has faced legal, systemic, and social obstacles, as one might have expected. And already some amendments have been made to it. But now we are facing a situation where this historic law is likely to be undermined. We are back to the era where community volunteers will present themselves in teaching positions where a certain kind of looseness will be permitted in the name of local varieties of control and where the stringent norms that the RTE provided for are not likely to be backed up by sufficient funding. There is no follow-up of the Tapas Mazumdar effort in any case over the last 10 years. But the manner in which the new document treats the Right to Education Act as simply uh, one of the many things that it's looking at is indeed something that makes one wonder why India cannot stick to the achievement it has made in the past. Why can't it sustain an effort started earlier, give it the credit that it deserves, and then maintain that effort for the next several decades? We have seen numerous such breaks in the past. New decisions are made for a few years. These decisions excite people and then they are forgotten. And it seems that in the context of Right to Education Act, we are witnessing the start of precisely that kind of um, trajectory. I say that particularly because we now are looking at, in this new, new document, an altogether new structure for the education of young children. The old structure, which started off with Kothari in 1966, offered 10 years of comprehensive school education with two years of higher secondary education. It was called popularly as 10 plus 2 system. We are now faced with the proposal of a new system, which is called 5 plus 3 for the elementary part. Now, how have the eight years of RTE now been restructured, you might ask? And at this point, particularly, it's somewhat uncomfortable to realize that already the RTE structure is going to be nudged so soon after its promulgation. So many states had managed to create an eight-year structure with five years of primary and three years of upper primary education. Well, the new structure takes us downwards to three years children, children's age at three, when they will be inducted into this early childhood program, which will last for five years including three years of preschool and the first two grades of primary. Now that makes it five. And then after facing an exam, they will have the remaining three years of the present primary school system, after which they will have three more years of upper primary. That's how this five plus three plus three new system works. And this early childhood education, which is of course a, a, a great um, foundational area needs to be looked at more carefully in our midst. Several years ago, the CBSC had appointed a committee called the Ganguly Committee, which was uh, faced with the question, how long should a feasible early childhood education should be for our country? And it came to the conclusion that two years of preschool education uh, is perhaps most suitable and feasible. Uh, and after that, grade one can start. That committee had taken into account the widespread tendency that our system has shown to start early childhood education 
with the alphabet with literacy and numeracy now so far it used to uh, be delayed as much as possible uh, in many parts of the country to age 4 and in many parts age 5 and perhaps you are aware that in many uh, countries of the world introduction of reading is delayed up to grade up to age 6 though there are countries where it starts much earlier we are now looking at that point where perhaps 3 year olds will be involved in what we are now being presented with namely a foundational literacy and numeracy program that explicitly aims at making children school ready when they are about to join grade 1 of education so in a way the distinction between the years of early childhood and the primary school years that begin at uh, age 6 or after completion of age 5 that distinction is about to be blurred the instrumentality of this process for the millions of children in india uh, will be the anganwadi which for so many years has served india's children uh, but has never been seen uh, as a as an educational institution its new incarnation will make it um, a part of this new system and one can only wish it well at this moment but at this moment it's also important for us to look at a theoretical question what are the perils of prematurely imparted literacy to a child what are the perils of making the child school ready from such an early age now it's already happening so one doesn't need to speculate it's already happening in uh, our metropolitan cities and many smaller towns as well that right from the age of 3 if not earlier children are being prepared for grade 1 so de facto grade 1 has come down to uh, age 3 and at that age when children uh, don't even have uh, 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 bones properly formed bones in their hands they are taught to write uh, before they have experience of language in diverse registers they are presented with the alphabet and what is known in the circle of social linguistics as reading without meaning is promoted by the time a child comes to grade 1 uh, many teachers will testify to this that the bridge between meaning and words has already snapped decades of theoretical research on this matter around the world shows that once this bridge is broken it's very difficult to rebuild it in the rest of life because this is the bridge through which children cross over from spoken language into a uh, written language which can be read because when we read a book our hope is to make sense of it to imagine what is it that the author of this book is trying to tell us and where is he or she coming from these acts of analogical imaginative thinking become impossible for those who are taught in mechanistic ways in early childhood and uh, therefore this is a matter of great national importance as uh, we enter the era of introduction of literacy at an early age using surveys which are of a dubious nature that tell us that uh, our achievement in primary and upper primary grades in these areas of reading and arithmetic is poor um, these surveys are not particularly academically so reliable and yet as a source of information uh, uh, they do sometimes serve the purpose of alerting us but one had never imagined that they will be used as a basis for um a new draft of a national policy they are and so we are at a point uh where it seems that uh, the great amount of awareness that since the days of tagore uh we have accumulated about how children move along on the path to becoming fully aware and sensitive citizens 
that great tradition of knowledge to which so many have contributed, that tradition perhaps now is going to be a thing of the past. One also worries about at this juncture on how the grade one teacher is going to deal with the challenges of primary education. The children who are uh, coming with a kind of literacy and numeracy, which is not necessarily associated with the child's attempt to make sense of things, make sense of the world. This teacher that the RTE Act had envisaged uh, with so much clarity in its chapter five will now face a new challenge. States that had already created um, a structure which would fit the RTE will have to start all over again. And we hopefully will see uh, some genuine inquiry by different states to see how feasible this exercise of placing three earlier preschool years with first two years of primary education, how this idea works. The idea of introducing exams, which was prohibited in the RTE, has in any case come back to an amendment. So powerful is the pressure of systemic tendencies, which even though disruptive on many other levels, this policy is unable to disrupt. Permit me to say that I'm not taking a bleak view, necessarily bleak view. Education is affected by a vast number of factors, including the ingenuity of the teacher and the force of circumstances under which society expects governments to work. And with great faith in our society and our nation, I do hope that the way in which the new document's vision will unfold, it will prove self-corrective. Thank you. Thank you very much, Professor Krishna Kumar. <clears throat> I now call upon Professor Menon. He would be speaking to us on perspective of higher education, a uh, reference to the new education policy. Professor Menon, please. Thank you. Hello, panelists and listeners. Um, policies are usually made sense of in terms of their text, subtext, and context. In the case of uh, the National Education Policy 2020, a serious engagement with the text is not very meaningful at this stage, in my opinion, since the strategy documents and a program of action that should ideally have accompanied the policy document are still awaited. Moreover, given that the policy was born in the middle of a major economic crisis, there is no clarity about how much financial, how much of financial resources that will be available in that in actuality to support implementation of the policy. Without a strategy, a roadmap, and clarity about how the necessary additional resources are going to be mobilized, the policy document is largely a vision and a list of intentions by the central government. What's more, NEP 2020 is not yet, in the real sense of the term, a national policy, because one doesn't quite know how well prepared the state governments are to implement this, battered as they are by the present pandemic crisis and the consequent contraction in the economy, not to mention the outstanding problems of revenue sharing under GST. After all, the states account for about 75 to 80 percent of the total public spending on education. In the light of all this, I think it's a little too premature for us to engage in detail with the specific provisions of the policy. It's a bit like debating on the future of an infant still struggling with acute neonatal trauma, a part of which stems out of congenital disorders that might turn out to be chronic. One must, however, hasten to add that the situation is nothing very unique about NEP 2020. The years that followed the promulgation of NPE in 1968 saw a major war, an unprecedented refugee crisis, inflation, and <clears throat> repeated devaluation of currency, resulting in uh, large-scale diversion of funds away from education 
and thus leaving several proposals in the policy relegated to the margins or severely under-resourced. In the case of NPE 1986, its promulgation was followed by the fall of a majority government and an alternative education policy that, was, that the succeeding government tried to moot. By the time a program of action was eventually released in 1992, the context had already changed drastically because of the balance of payment crisis and the structural readjustments that the government had to bring about as a consequence. Keeping one pace ahead of its predecessors, the NEP 2020 is born into the vortex in the very epicenter of a crisis. What makes it more curious is that the birthing of NEP 2020 is not through natural delivery, but through a caesarean section. It is as though its um, birth is timed to be at the very moment when India is going through its worst economic crisis since independence. Now here the spotlight shifts to the context of the policy. You can't find fault with someone who would wonder whether the promulgation of NEP 2020 couldn't have waited till the pandemic crisis was over when parliamentary and other legislative and consultative processes would get back to some kind of normalcy. That was a commission report and deliberated at length by a committee of parliamentarians before it was debated and approved by the parliament. As for NP 1986, it was an outcome of a perspective uh, document called Challenge of Education, a policy perspective that had been put through a process of wide consultation. The draft doc uh, policy document was then debated by the parliament and eventually approved. Keeping with this precedence, couldn't the NEP 2020 also have been given its due legitimacy through the process of a proper parliamentary debate and approval, even if one might argue that it was not a statutory requirement. Given the majority support that the present government has in parliament, the approval of the policy would never have been at risk. However, through that exercise, the policy document would have gained a great deal in substance as well as in form, particularly its legitimacy and acceptability. Wouldn't that have given both the policy as well as the parliament their due dignity? Through our recent years experience, we have gotten used to how great spectacles are periodically curated for the consumption of the citizens in what Shashi Tharoor uh, terms as a shock and awe style. Were the chosen time and the manner of promulgation of NEP 2020 also specially curated, perhaps for managing headlines in the middle of other crises? What might be the larger political purpose that the NEP 2020 might be serving? Would this also be a component in the political strategy of a strong central government to make incursions into the domain of the states? These questions need thoughtful examination. I will not attempt it now because my brief for this afternoon is limited. That is to look at the policy from the perspective of higher education. I have several issues in my mind about public higher education, particularly about state universities and their colleges, where a large proportion of our students study. The under-resourced and anemic status of these institutions worries me no end. I would tend to think that the projected increase in the GER as per the policy from the present 26% to 50% by 2035 will impose immense additional burden on public systems. Unless adequately resourced, we will be continuing to let down millions of first-generation higher education seekers with the farce of granting access to higher education but with no assurance of quality. Access without quality is no access at all. This is a critical issue, but I will not talk about it today. I would rather wait for the strategy documents and the program of action to be released for a more substantive discussion on this matter. So let me get back to the text. The, my focus is related to the policy documents listing of problems in uh, higher education, its vision statement, and some issues around it. The section on higher education in NEP 2020 begins with a credo that, and I quote, this policy envisions a complete overhaul and re-energizing of higher education system, unquote. The policy starts with listing the problems currently faced by India's higher education. The problems highlighted in this list include fragmentation, lack of focus on cognitive outcomes, disciplinary entrenchments, suboptimal governance and leadership, ineffective regulatory system, affiliating structure, and so on. 
Some of these like disciplinary entrenchment or affiliating structure may well be useful starting points for policy thinking, but some other items in the list like suboptimal governance and leadership is only a system, is only a symptom. The pathology clearly is political and bureaucratic interference, which unfortunately the policy document fights shy of acknowledging. I, f I find this listing, listing of problems problematic in that it is highly judgmental. The policy document does not uh, deem it necessary to offer any reasoning that went into this listing of problems. Since there is no reasoning, there is also no diagnosis of the underlying maladies. It is as though there is nothing to explore and understand about what has made it possible historically for some of the institutions of higher education in India to do fairly well, even amidst the general gloom. Example, uh, for example, Indian Institute of Science, the first generation IITs, JNU, Jadapur, among the older universities, and among undergraduate colleges, St. Xavier's College in Bombay, half a dozen of Delhi University's undergraduate colleges, Presidency College in Calcutta. Some thoughtful reflection would have been uh, useful on why several highly accomplished universities of the past have regressed over the years into mediocrity. For example, Bombay, Madras, Patna, Mysore, Baroda, Allahabad, Pune, to name just a few. It should also have been useful to reflect on the recent experiences of several new universities that had been established since the turn of the millennium and have not made much of a mark, while a small subset of them like Ashoka University, Ambedkar University, Delhi, and Korea University seem to show promise. In 2008-2009, the government of India established some 16 central universities with an identical legislative template. It would have been good to examine why most of them have, have not bloomed to the extent they promised in these past 12 years, while a couple of them do show promise. Such an analysis uh, while formulating this policy would have made this list of problems not merely one of symptoms, but would have thrown some light on the underlying pathology. An analysis of this kind would have led the policy document to be informed by the realization that unplanned growth, deficit funding, bureaucratization, politicking among the academic community and governmental and political interference in governance as well as in faculty hiring are among the reasons why some of the well-established older institutions have regressed to mediocrity. The policy document would have also been enriched by the possible inference that wherever institutions have done well in spite of all these odds, it may be at least partly because they have been, they have been left without much meddling and have been allowed to grow in their own pace and in directions they themselves considered most appropriate. In other words, they have been recognized as organic entities. Each rooted in their own context and each constituted of an academic community who as a collegial body determines how best to respond to the social needs of where they are located. Also, funding is a vitally critical um, factor. If the IITs have done well, it has also been because the per capita public investment in these institutions has been multiple times higher in comparison to that in other public higher education institutions. The policy document's vision of higher education comes across through a text that is exceedingly wordy and somewhat repetitive, all of which does not add much to its comprehensibility. For instance, the term multidisciplinary comes up repeatedly in the document. There is also invocation of institutions of higher education in ancient India like Takshashila, Nalanda, Vallabhi and Vikram, Vikram Shila and an eloquent testimony to Barnabata's 7th century novel Kadambari to highlight the importance of holistic and multidisciplinary education. In spite of all this, one is still left wondering what the term multidisciplinary is all about. Some of our universities in contemporary times could well be practicing not merely holistic and multidisciplinary education, but also transdisciplinary and interdisciplinary courses and programs. But the policy document um, would not acknowledge any of them. It would much rather invoke an ancient past. The subtext here is that after a hiatus, of more than a thousand years, there would now be an effort through this policy to revive some of the values and practices of ancient India. The policy document paints not merely in broad strokes, but, it, but at times even in finer details, the broad landscape of higher education in India by 2040. By that time, if the policy has its way, Indian higher education ecosystem will be populated with 
higher education institutions comprising universities and colleges public as well as private all of which will be multidisciplinary and each populated by more than 3000 students at least one in or near every district universities will do research as well as postgraduate and undergraduate teaching some research intensive and some others teaching intensive while colleges will largely be teaching at the undergraduate level a number of them having medium of instruction in local or indian languages or bilingually the colleges may manifest as constituent colleges organizationally if not physically clustered around universities or as stand alone autonomous colleges this vision is promising although this projected landscape might not might resemble somewhat what obtains even now except for the slated intention of gradually dismantling the affiliation structure and enabling each higher education institution to eventually become independent self governing institutions with considerable faculty and institutional autonomy all this is very heartening but the imagination of in the design of the policy runs dry beyond this statement of vision since the policy document forfeits the opportunity of probing into the basic pathology that is eroding the system as i mentioned earlier it is its intended treatment is in terms of more of what administrators are used to and comfortable with albeit with some differences all that the document has come up with as a way to get to this ideal situation is by assembling an elaborate accreditation and regulatory system out of the debris of the existing ones the strategy is essentially herding institutions through a series of exercises that demonstrate compliance to standard and uniform templates enforced and operated by a large number of private accreditors overseen by a new regulatory architecture at the national level how is this new regulatory regime going to be different from what exists now except for the replacement of an existing edifice of regulatory institutions by a new architecture of institutions the policy document assures us that the regulatory system is going to be a light but tight affair i shall wait for the strategy documents to offer operational model of this light but tight regime the problem as i see is that much of the mediocrity in the system that the policy rightly identifies stems out of a culture of mistrust and control the seeds of which are in the very dna of our larger system not confined to education so unless there is going to be a larger administrative reform i am somewhat skeptical about how the vision of higher education in the policy is going to be realized in spirit and in substance the uh, the policy's endorsement of liberal education unfortunately does not hold much credibility because of the general environment of fear that pervades all over this country and particularly on in our campuses and that cannot support creativity and a free flow of ideas i genuinely feel sad that we may have forfeited another opportunity to really overhaul the system through a shift to a new paradigm of trust easing of control decentralization and distribution of power multiple nodes of regulation and a lateral flow of ideas instead the nep 2020 has turned out to be yet another exercise of imposing uniformity and standardization along a single axis of control and power which is paradoxically given india's size uh, which is paradoxical given india's size population diversity and constitutional federalism i hope better sense prevail while preparing strategies and programs of action thank you for your patience and thank you iic for this opportunity. Thank you, Professor Vernon. <coughs> Mr. Bhattacharya, we are slightly behind time, so I request you to remain within your limits. Please go ahead. Sure. Thank you. Thank you very much for giving me this opportunity of uh, discussing essential features of the national education policy, of which three very eminent speakers who had been uh, particularly. Uh, uh interested in the particular topic have already spoken professor anurag behar has explained very clearly the choices before the drafting committee and how uh, the uh, how within the 60 65 pages has been accomplished professor krishna kumar has raised certain very very valid points in so far as 
a structural change that has been proposed in school education. I will come to that a little later. Professor Menon has raised certain genuine concerns also about what he considers as the legitimacy of the document because it has not been approved by the parliamentary process. <clears throat> now, in so far as Professor Krishna Kumar's point is concerned, that starting early, what is known as early you know, childhood care and education from the age of three conflicts with the RTE, which is primarily meant for 16 to 6 to 14 year students. The earlier 10 plus 2 system took care of 6 to 18 years. And the present structure that has been envisaged in this NEP, which is a substantial departure from the earlier policies, is to have it is to have a 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4, that is 3 to 18 years for children. But this is, I suppose, based on the premise that over 85% of a child's cumulative brain development occurs prior to the age of six. Now, this is very, very important. Now, I understand the concerns Professor Krishna Kumar has raised, but I think there is a point on the other side as well. But my suggestion would be at this stage not to rush it through. We need not go immediately to amend the act or amend the RTE. Let us see how the RTE itself unfolds over the years and gradually the 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 system should be introduced. As I find, the NEP is an extension of the, in a sense, is an extension of the earlier national education policies of 1968 based on Kothari Commission recommendations, as also the 1986 policy modified in 1992. We can therefore fairly presume that a national policy would be having a life of about 25 to 30 years. That is, in so far as the present NEP 2020 is concerned, it should have or should ideally have a life of up to 2050. If we go through this document, I find that despite some significant departures, despite some significant new insights included, the document can survive a longish period provided the implementation is done in the right spirit. Now, insofar as the legitimacy of the document is concerned, I don't have, uh, I am not sure I agree with Professor Menon, because after the draft NEP was published, it was in the public domain for a very long time. Over 2 lakh uh, representations or suggestions have been received, including from state chief ministers and all. Therefore, the final draft, which has come in about 60 plus pages from the uh, final document, which is about 60 plus pages, which has been distilled from the 500 plus pages of the draft NEP does make a lot of sense. It appears to be progressive, but its problem lies elsewhere. Earlier, the education specialists have spoken as a humdrum administrator who was involved for some time in the educational administration. I have the following points to make. <clears throat> First is I, the basic departures, as I mentioned, in the case of school education, it is 5 plus 3 plus 3 plus 4 structure. And very importantly, the stress on multilingualism. Now, this multilingualism is very, very important. And the importance of translation, translation studies, and all these things have been highlighted in the document. I find it very important. The third point, which I find very important, is giving equal importance to numeracy as with literacy. The universal foundational New literacy and numeracy by grade three is sought to be achieved by 2025. How it's a progressive goal, but how it can be achieved is another issue which I will be coming to a little later. Insofar as higher education is concerned, I agree with Professor Shamanan that there have been a surfeit of adjectives. An impression seems to have been given that this document uh, makes a clean departure from everything in the past, which is not. There have been also terms like light and tight, which I didn't particularly like. But all said and done, the document has been approved by the cabinet. It is now in the public domain. And our stress should be to ensure how best it can be implemented. Now, as an administrator, that's my main concern. And I find its implementation is going to face a lot of problems, especially because the document 
is very very ambitious it tries to accomplish many things in a very short period of time do we have the adequate financial resources or even the human resources in order to achieve such goals the first point i want to mention is that at this particular point of time the government cannot spend additional financial resources for the implementation of the nep but it can appoint the right kind of persons in the various uh, uh, commissions in the various structures that have been proposed now this is where the trust has to come it's not a government education policy it's a national education policy therefore not only all these bodies should have representations of various shades of various disciplines it should also be accommodated of the best minds representing various shades of opinions now how the uh, leadership is going is uh, is going to be provided in the higher education commission of india and the four verticals under it the regulatory council the accreditation council the grants council and general education council is something which every indian would be observing with great interest the second point is it has been mentioned that the currently the expenditure is about 4.4 the public expenditure on education including medical education is about 4.43% of the gdp which is thought to be increased to 6% which means there has to be a 40% increase in terms of percentage of gdp over the next couple of years this is not going to be easy because most of the funding has come from this has to come from the state governments which are already suffering from all kinds of problems therefore my suggestion would be to have more on the government's expenditure side if we read the draft uh, nep it mentioned the the current expenditure is about, on education is about 10% of the total government government public exp, uh, total government's budget that has got to be increased to 20% over the next 10 years or so over the now if that is to be done we have to think of how every year whether one or two percent additional expenditure uh, has got to be provided for in so far as the educational expenditures are concerned now a clear road map has to be drawn up by the government how the increase in expenditure is going to be met in the years to come the, as i mentioned the draft nep mentioned 20% of government expenditure in the next 10 years from the current 10% which means that at least every year approximately 2% additional expenditures has to be shown for education in the next 10 years or so as such this is a very very important thing that we must look into the other thing that i find in the in so far as higher education is concerned that a stress is being given to bring research back to the universities and then nrf is supposed that has been envisaged in the document is supposed to accomplish that particular goal this takes me if we look at about 100 years ago in calcutta university when sir arthur mukherjee was the vice chancellor the major developments in science the saha equation was the uh, ionization equation was done in 1920 the bose statistics bose einstein statistics came up in 1924 the raman effect in 29 similarly in the fields of philosophy radha krishnan and surendranath das gupta were producing books which are still relevant even 100 years from the time they were published first now research was essentially epicenter of research whether in, even in the sciences was primarily in the universities if this this document envisages that it should come back to the university system again hopefully that can be accomplished and that in in turn would enhance the quality of teaching also in the university systems i would therefore suggest that a citizens forum and iic can take a lead in this particular regard should kept monitoring the progress of expenditure and outputs we should measure what has been the outcome administrators quite often get bogged into saying that we are spending so much of money but in so far as expenditure per student is concerned as amartya sen and others had argued long ago that in so far as school education is concerned our expenditure per student is less than that of in even in sub saharan africa therefore there if the government is serious as as we all know government seriousness can be measured by two things what amount of money it is going to commit into this particular sector and what kind of people it is going to post in the top leadership positions now this is something which is going to be watched over the years and the citizens forum can keep a track on this and this in the 
rough document, there was a process, there was something which has been deleted in the final document, the remedial measures to counter poor learning outcomes, especially in the school education system. Somehow I find that is not there in the final document. Possibly that, that is something we should think over. And there was another very important thing which was included in the draft document, that is the Rashtriya Shiksha Ayog should be headed by the Prime Minister. That has been deleted from here. Now, since this document is very, very ambitious, it requires not coordination between the Ministry of Education and the Ministry of Finance, as also between the Ministry of Women and Child Development, so far as Angan Bodies and others are concerned, but also with large number of states. The coordination problem is going to be huge. And unless it is taken up at the Prime Minister's level, it is impossible for the Ministry of Education to steer it through. And my suggestion is that at least there should be a cabinet committee on education which can be developed, which can be set up. And the cabinet committee on education should look up, headed by the prime minister, should ensure that the implementation of the major recommendations of the NEP take place in the proper time bound manner. Thank you. Thank you. Sir, uh, sir, if you permit, I can uh, take the questions, I will read the questions and put it to the speakers to answer these questions. If you permit, sir. Hello, can you hear me? Yeah, yes, I can hear you, sir. Srivastava, can you hear me? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Kalash, can you hear me? Yes, I, I can could hear 80% uh, of what uh, Mr. Bhattacharya said. What was not audible to me anyway. Uh, now we are almost 527. Uh, how many questions do you have, Kalash? Uh, sir, uh, we, we have got a large number of questions, but I am confining only to uh, five questions. Uh, and again, I am uh, grouping these questions uh, speaker wise. So uh, I'll uh, put uh, three questions together to first to start with uh, Professor Krishna Kumar, and then uh, two questions uh, together to Professor Bihar, and one question to Professor uh, Shyam Menon. Tell you, uh, tell you. Please go. Uh, sir, uh, uh, I would like to uh, first uh, start with by mentioning that uh, this webinar has evoked a uh, lot of response across the country. Uh, more than 800 persons have uh, logged in uh, to this webinar. Uh, sir, uh, 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 there are three questions uh, which are addressed to uh, Professor Krishna Kumar. The first one is, what is the purpose of nests, uh, what is the purpose of national exams in class three, class five, and class eight? Would it not put pressure on students at young age? Uh, the second question to Krish Professor Krishna Kumar is that NEP 20 has merged various groups under one category of SEDGs, SEDGs, which constitute majority population of students. What will be its implication uh, of merging the categories at a school level? And the third question is, sir, does not Shah Rukh Khan saying school ke baad baiju raise a big question mark on our current Indian education system. Does this kind of advertisement show the real image of current education system in India? Will the new education policy change this perspective of our education system where everyone needs tuition classes after school? Professor Kishwar, please. These questions are addressed to you. Thank you. <clears throat> uh, my answer to the first question is that yes, uh, reintroduction of an examination-based evaluation system uh, in the elementary uh, classes uh, at these two or three points will certainly increase stress on children. As it is, we are proposing uh, starting of uh, their education from such a tender age of three. And given the realities of our early childhood provisions right now, uh, the stress on children, which is already very high across the system, can only increase. 
with the uh, introduction of exams, something which the Right to Education Act uh, had prohibited. Now, um, the result of this stressful situation is that a tuition system, a parallel coaching system, has um, taken place across the system, right from early childhood up to the highest stage of school education. Uh, we notice that across the country, a coaching tuition system has uh, virtually become a parallel system. Uh, and in many cases, it undermines the main school system. It seems that uh, given the uh, realities of how this restructuring uh, will unfold, uh, the coaching and the tuition system is not likely to diminish at all. In fact, it may flourish. Um, there is no consideration at the moment as to how we will increase uh, quality in early childhood education. At the moment, we don't have even norms for it. And they can't be created out of the sky. Um, the entire issue of focusing on this parallel system has been, in fact, ignored. And one can read the document thinking that uh, our system actually doesn't have such a parallel system, uh, which has seriously undermined uh, the purposes of education uh, by making it so important for every child to take coaching on tuition at some stage or the other. In fact, our IITs and our medical colleges, they're all now uh, admitting students who have been heavily coached. It's not a competition among uh, the most potential engineers and doctors among children. Rather, it's a competition among how much uh, expenditure has been made by parents for coaching their children uh, for these entrance tests. So in that sense, the system has been undermined and is likely to uh, remain like that. And this particular malaise can only increase as years come by. Uh, the second question I couldn't quite hear, if you may kindly uh, repeat it once. The, the second question is that uh, NEP20 has merged various groups under one category of SEDG, which can suit majority population of students what will be implication of this merging of categories at a school level? Yes. Uh, when it comes to recognizing the specific uh, uh, categories uh, that the government system has worked with so far, it's unfortunate that this document doesn't uh, recognize those categories, whether it's the scheduled castes or uh, the scheduled tribes or uh, uh, the minorities. Uh, or uh, other forms of social disadvantage, uh, including uh, the other backward classes and so on. Uh, the lumping together of all these very sociologically entrenched and well-recognized categories into a broader, generalized kind of title is certainly problematic. And one doesn't know exactly what's the purpose of that lumping, when in fact we know that it's a matter of pride for our country that our policies of positive discrimination uh, have worked despite all obstacles and across the world they are appreciated. The extent to which uh, the goals of equity have been served by a policy of reservation and special treatment of different groups and recognition of these different groups, the extent to which these policies have been pursued over the years has been a matter of some appreciation or even though there are uh, numerous uh, uh, causes of dissatisfaction, but the general direction has been appreciated. Uh, what's the point of now lumping these categories and forgetting them as if they don't exist, as if India doesn't have a caste-divided society, as if we don't have problems of uh, disadvantage over generations, as if our tribal children um, uh, have the same starting point as anybody else. Uh, it's a kind of an act of pretension. And unfortunately, the document does have many such acts of pretension, kind of wishing away a reality by not noticing it and uh, creating a sort of a fantasy of all problems getting resolved. This speaks of a very imaginative kind of instrumentality, uh, which is certainly problematic if you are looking for 
uh, good insights and practical solutions. Thank you. Uh, the the next set of questions is to Professor Anurag Bihar. Uh, the new policy, how much it would be effective in the globalized world? It lays a lot of emphasis on education in uh, local language, whereas English is becoming an important mode of conversation in this world. The second question is, why the final document of NEP is so different from the draft submitted in 2019? And the third question, this third question has been asked by a very senior IS officer, Mr. Dev Shahayam. He says that this policy is predatory policy with the center violating the constitution and federal structure of India. How can the center arbitrarily grab school education from the states and dictate terms? School education must return to the state's list as it was before 1976. Professor Anurag Bihar. Thank you. Uh, so, how does this policy respond to the increased globalization, increased uh, integration of the globe and things? Like yes. Well, and I think that question's focus was particularly on the matter of education and that to English. So, uh, I think the policy just bases itself on uh, the well understood, the well recorded, the, uh, the with overbearing evidence that uh, children learn better in their own language. And therefore the policy recommends that uh, the medium of instruction should be, should be their own language. Now at the same time, it is equally emphatic that children learn multiple languages well and much better at a younger age. So the policy is while focusing on the matter that let's make the mother tongue, the local language, the home language as the medium of instruction. But at the same time, through multiple measures is encouraging the idea of multilingualism. And within that multilingualism, it's of course Indian languages, but certainly there is English. So I don't think the policy in any way is disbalancing the fundamental education issue that the mother tongue is a better medium of instruction versus perhaps these aspirations and the economic needs of learning other languages, including English. Uh, the second question was to do with uh, why is the 66 page policy very different from the 484 page policy <laughs> yes. uh, now you know that's a question i will find it very hard to answer because i was involved in writing the 484 page policy i was not involved in cutting down the 484 pages into the 66 pages but i can speculate uh, one part of the speculation is that uh, it, uh, it just in the sheer mechanics of summarizing 484 pages into 66 pages, a lot of it is lost. And what you lose, some of it might just be happenstance, some of it might be purposive, I don't know. So I think some of the differences are because of that. Some of the differences are because uh, perhaps uh, at the policy level, uh, when the final policy was decided upon, uh, the government of India did want to take a few different stances from what is there in the draft national education policy. But I must, uh, I must say that, uh, uh, yes, there are differences. Uh, yes, there are some noticeable differences, but uh, it's not as dramatic as the question seemed to suggest. But let me remind you, I'm just speculating here because I was not involved in cutting down the 484 pages to 66 pages. Uh, the third is that, is the central, the union government predatory and uh, is it taking over the state's uh, 
rights and responsibilities of school education well perhaps that um, perhaps that trend goes back a long way if that's happening uh, however i must say that if you if one reads the problems policy carefully on the school education side it is making suggestions if you read the text that's what it's doing it is making suggestions it is in no way suggesting that the government of india is actually deciding that that's exactly the way it will be now uh, when the kothari commission recommendations were implemented the situation was pretty much the same how are you going to have a nationally coherent uh, set of principles if not exactly the same system at the same time leaving to the state or why just the state to the school what is due to the state and the school so we've been through this before i don't read this policy as being particularly predatory uh, on the rights of the states the next question is uh, to uh, professor uh, menon this the question asker is very important person dr ramesh and deka who was a uh, director of all in ensure the medical sciences his question is how to internationalize higher education in india <laughs> uh, well <laughs> uh, this is not about the policy surely uh, i think if yes. it's for about the policy one should ask the people who wrote the policy no it's not for relating it's to policy it is about, a general question um, you know the global excellence and uh, globally uh, accepted standards and so on uh, is often um, you know is often understood and it's not just about this policy but for several years maybe for some 10 15 years in india this discourse of um, you know uh, uh, what is what is of international standards and global standards uh, world standards all these used to be said and i i really feel that a, a globally excellent institution has to be first of all locally relevant so uh, only when it has an organic uh, rooting on firm firm rooting on a particular stratum and is responding to that stratum uh, uh, in an organic manner uh, uh, then can it rise itself to the level of a global inst- globally excellent institution so international standards is largely in that sense i wouldn't be really uh, you know think in terms of just collaborations and uh, uh, you know and faculty exchanges and uh, twinning programs and stuff like that alone that doesn't really create much of an international standards neither will uh, inviting um, uh, world players uh, in uh, foreign universities to come and set up shops here we are also not is not going to help i think we need to really work in terms of creating excellent faculty and if we, institutions have to be developed there has to be good faculty and we have to think of a serious program of uh, creating excellence in our prospective faculty attracting young bright people to come into a- academia um, a, a, a lot of attitudinal the, the whole environmental the ethos has to change for that at the moment it's very unhappy situation i hope it it doesn't last for long but at least in public universities it's a, it's an environment of um, uh, you know uh, being feeling oppressed and fearful and i don't think those are the places where good research will happen and uh, those are the places will innovation of ideas will happen uh, all this will happen only if there is a certain liberality in the way in which universities the ecosystem of universities located and only then will we rise to the international standards it it's not just a ligo toy approach of uh, you know uh, creating um, standard templates in various parts of the country and uh, w- uh, with linkages with uh, institutions abroad and suddenly it becomes international i don't think it happens like that sir with your permission one last Is question the end of the question <laughs> one, one last mm. question sir one last question several uh, Uh, members of the audience uh, they have inquired regarding the fate of the existing teachers the question is when will recruitment of teachers will start in government school as per nep 20 and uh, what will be the future of present teachers under nep 
I think these this is these uh, this question could be answered jointly by Professor Anurag Bihar and uh, Mr. Amita Bhattacharya. I want to clear. In so far as the NEP is concerned, who is supposed to answer? Mr. Jointly, Mr. Amita Bhattacharya and Professor Anurag Bihar. This is regarding the inquiries regarding the fate of the existing yeah, teachers yeah. and when the recruitments under the new policy of teachers is going to start. No, the NEP how, how can they answer? They are, they are not in the government. Yeah. How can they answer? I don't think but this NEP question needs to be answered. I think, Kalash, you can proceed to. Are you going to deliver no, your yes, water not tank? Not source. Uh, <laughs> sir, now we come to the end of the program. Uh, on, I would, on behalf of India Industry Center, uh, I would like to profusely thank uh, Professor Narag Bihar, Dr. Krishna Kumar, Professor uh, Shah Menon for sparing their time for this webinar. And as I had mentioned earlier, this webinar has really aroused a lot of interest and uh, uh, the number of participants who have joined this webinar indicates that. And I'm sure today's deliberations are definitely going to be much more helpful in understanding uh, this new policy. So with these words, I once again thank each one of you profusely on behalf of IAC, and I look forward for your more and more participation in, in IAC webinars and uh, physical programs in future. And in the end, I also like to thank our uh, president, uh, Sri Anirvora, who was kind enough to spare his time for uh, chairing this uh, entire uh, session. Uh, thank you very much, sir. And I thank everybody who has uh, joined uh, this webinar uh, through the virtual mode. Thank you very much. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank, thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Okay.